Hi, everyone. Welcome. Uh, it's really great. I think we have almost 100 people here today. And my name is Pam Saltenberger. I'm the president of the Kingsley Art Club. And I'm really, really excited about this whole season that we've been able to present some pretty amazing lectures. And our lecture today is going to be pretty amazing as well. So I just wanted to update you a little teeny bit about Kingsley. We did a big day of giving for the very first time and we raised $4,400. Yay! <laughs> so we were really pleased about that. And that helps us not only put on our lectures, but we have a high school art show, we have a community college art show, we do a lot of outreach, uh, we have an initiative called the Kingsley Initiative where we help support BIPOC um, artists in our community. And so we're doing a lot of stuff. So we're using the money wisely. But I do want to let you know, we already have the fall schedule set up. And so I'll let you know who those people are. Um, we do have an addition, which is next month. And Scott Shields, who's the chief curator here at the Crocker, is going to talk about California Impressionism. And it's a wonderful, I've heard him speak before, and as I'm sure most of you have. And he's always enjoyable, and he's got lots to present. Um, in August, July, we take off. In August, we have Lorraine Garcia Nakata. And she's one of the original pilots of the Royal Chicano Air Force. Um, she's going to present her, her work and her life. So I think that one will be a wonderful um, lecture for you to come to. In September, Alan Templeton is coming back. And I bet a lot of you, how many of you were here for his lecture in the past? OK, lots. Well, he's going to talk about his more recent um, acquisitions that he's given to the Crocker. And he's also, um, William Brussel will be his interviewer. And I'm hoping that he will do what he did the last time, which was take as many people that wanted to go into the gallery and he would talk about the individual pieces that he has donated to the Crocker. In October, we have Peter Wayne Lewis and his work is hanging in the Crocker. He's very interesting, he was born in Jamaica, he's from Sacramento, and he spends his time between New York, the New York metropolitan area and Beijing. And um, he's a very interesting artist and an interesting speaker. And then in November, we have Kurt Fishback, and he had his first major exhibition at the Crocker in 1981. I've had a very long career as a photographer, and I think you will enjoy that. And just so you know, we are working on the spring and fall um, schedule as well, and we will present that to you guys as soon as we have it. So keep looking for your at your emails and at the e-blast. We've been doing a lot of social media and a lot of e-blast to folks, so just keep in touch and make sure that you attend all these great lectures because they're very fun. So with that, I'm going to introduce, which probably all of you know, William Ishmael, who's the program chair of the Kingsley Art Club, and he's going to introduce our speaker. Thanks very much. It's my pleasure to introduce Michelle McCormick uh, for a couple reasons. One is you'll see her art, and her art speaks for itself. But I look at her art as the gateway drug into learning about birds and birds' habits and patterns and uh, their habitats. And so her knowledge of birds is deep and wide. And she has a daily email, which you can sign up for. There are cards at the table, and her slide will give you more information. I get an email every day from Michelle with a different bird picture and a different story about that bird. And it's fascinating. I love it. <clears throat> but the other reason that I'm happy to introduce Michelle is I've known her for a really long time. I think when we met, neither one of us could spell art, but she's gone on and done an incredible job. Her love of photography in her particularly blossomed in her post-retirement years, and she has done a number of different kinds of photography, but fell in love with birds. But she doesn't just do that in her retirement. She also has a modeling career. Um, she models for advertisements and commercials. And she's been in a movie. So she's, pretty, she's a pretty amazing person. So with that, Michelle McCormick.
Thank you. What fun it is to be here and get to talk about my favorite subject. Um, and what fun it is to get to be here and wear this orange dress because most of my wardrobe is camo. So <laughs> that's a treat. Um, and I, I do want to say just right from the beginning that many speakers become very annoyed when people in the audience are doing their social media. But I want you to know during this talk, if you feel inclined to tweet, I would feel it totally appropriate to this topic. So go right ahead. So um, for those of you who may be wondering, this bird is a northern shoveler coming in to land. And you may kind of wonder, how does a photographer get this picture? And I'll tell you exactly how I got this picture, which is I got up at 4 AM on a very cold December morning and drove 75 miles north to the Sacramento National Wildlife Refuge where I had rented a photo blind for the day, which is about the size of a phone booth. So I put on waders to wade out through the icy water to the phone booth uh, and lay down on the floor with my camera looking out at water level in case a bird might come and land nearby. I knew I could wait just as long as my bladder could hold out because there are no amenities in a $20 a day photo blind. So luckily for me, along came this northern shoveler and landed, and I got the shot. So in other words, I am in it for the glamour. <laughs> so just a little bit about my background. I um, became interested in photography in my college years. I majored in radio, TV, and film, and took a whole bunch of photography classes. And uh, at the time, I thought I was taking pictures that were illustrating depth of field and whether we should use uh, Tri-X or Pan-X film and doing wet work in dark rooms and all that kind of stuff. Um, decades go by, and I look back at these photos that I found when I was getting ready to retire, and I had kind of captured an era. Um, my career took me in a different direction. But when I found these photos, I thought, why? Why did I ever stop doing photography? I love photography. So along about 2010, I decided to get back into it. And of course, the world had changed. Um, film was no longer happening. Dark rooms were no longer happening. So I had to learn a little bit about digital photography and uh, try to figure out what it was that I wanted to do. And so for several years, i learning, taking classes, uh, and doing a lot of travel photography, uh, photos of people, sports, just everything I could think of. Uh, then something happened that happened to all of us, and that was COVID. And so for about six months, there we were, uh, isolated in our homes, restricted in our activities, what to do. Uh, and I was kind of at a loss. It came around to fall time, and I had always taken pictures of what I consider to be our celebrity birds that come to Sacramento every fall, the sandhill cranes, uh, the um, snow geese and some of the other birds, <clears throat> excuse me, the tundra swans that are here every fall. And I think everybody who t has ever taken a picture in Sacramento loves to take pictures of those birds. So I finally went out and started taking some pictures of sandhill cranes, and I had a revelation. And the revelation was, whoa, there's birds here all year long. <laughs> so, uh, I thought, geez, I, I could take pictures of birds. I don't have to worry about the COVID restrictions. Well, I was not the only person that had this concept. Uh, lots of people got interested in birds. Uh, I live across the street from, uh, I think it's called Wild Birds Unlimited, a bird store. And the owner of that store told me, you know, COVID was bad for a lot of reasons, but it was really good for my business. Uh, you know, even if people weren't photographers, uh, they wanted to uh, admire the birds in the backyard, and it was like a, oh, an awakening. It was something that we could all enjoy and all do. So uh, just a word for uh, techie people in the audience. Um, this is the equipment I use. Uh, different people have different ideas. I think Sony is the leader in you know, wildlife photographic equipment, and so that's what I use. Uh, turkey hunting chair. Uh, I made my boyfriend give me that for Christmas one year. He was like, what do you want with a turkey hunting chair? That's so I can sit low and just position myself sometimes in an area where there might be a lot of birds and see who comes and goes and kind of blend into the background. Um, 
pepper spray is necessary for wildlife and wild folks that one might encounter on the trail. So I have that, and uh, automobile can serve as a blind, and it does take some patience. Uh, people ask me sometimes, how do you get these birds to pose for you like that? <laughs> you know, the answer, of course, the answer is I don't. Uh, there are a lot of challenges to bird photography. Uh, the birds move very quickly. They don't pose. Uh, they hide in the bushes. Um, I have a friend here who's also a wonderful photographer, and we were just talking about how difficult it is right now. Uh, we love the spring, we love the summer, and we don't love all those leaves and the trees <laughs> that the birds can hide in. So that's always a challenge. Uh, I cannot tell you how many times I've been positioned to take just that perfect image of that bird doing that most interesting thing uh, when I hear a little sound behind me and it's a person with their dog saying, oh, don't worry, I'll just pass by really quickly. Oh. And, uh, so that, that kind of thing happens a lot. So bicyclists, dogs, walkers, you know, there, there are other people out there enjoying nature in their own way. Um, and, and then, of course, birds do position themselves against ugly backgrounds. There's nothing worse than a just a beautiful bird posing so wonderfully uh, on a garbage can. Uh, the other factor is, of course, I'm not always alone. Uh, this is in Japan, photographing snow cranes. Um, but there was a scene very much like this just here in Sacramento very recently when a rare bird showed up, a summer tanager that's uh, very unusual in our area. Word went out in the Sacramento uh, photography birding community. And uh, very quickly, people began to gather down at Fairy Tale Town, where the bird has been seen. And this is what it, what it looked like. Um, we have to say that in bird photography, there, there are ethical issues that have to be considered. And the main thing really is not to disturb the birds. Um, I've had well-meaning friends say, oh, what if we threw a rock or made a loud noise? Wouldn't the bird then fly? But those are exactly the kinds of things that, that we don't want to do. So we try to stay quiet. We try not to disturb the birds, um, try to keep our distance, um, try to stay away from, you know, from areas uh, where it might really be intruding into nesting areas, um, and keep our distance so that, so that the bird life is not interrupted. Um, there are some other ethical issues that come up with regard to bird photography. Um, and one of them actually came very much to my attention this morning. Um, and that is the, the new issue of AI. Uh, because there are now absolutely marvelous pictures of wonderful birds doing fabulous things uh, that never saw a bird and never saw a camera and no photographer was ever involved. Uh, and that's, a, that's gonna be a fascinating thing as it moves forward, I think. Um, uh, AI can do amazing things, and I hope that all photography will have to be labeled as having been AI generated. So, one of the best ways to <laughs> one of the best ways to understand how to take a, a good image of birds is to understand something about bird behavior. Uh, yes, hummingbirds tinkle too. Uh, and anyone who's photographed hummingbirds very often has an image of this sort. A hummingbird consumes at least double its body weight in fluids every day. So, you know, I have to go somewhere. Um, and there is a phrase among bird photographers that uh, it's well known that birds like to lighten the load before they take off. So uh, bird relieving itself is often a sign, a welcome sign to a photographer that um, that bird is about to take to wing, to take to flight, which is oftentimes the picture that you really want. Um, it can, however, result in a picture that you really don't want uh, with elements that are not aesthetically pleasing. But as we all know, that is why God invented Photoshop. Uh, migration uh, is one of the most wonderful things that happens in the Sacramento region. During a typical season, more than one billion, that's B billion, uh, birds fly through this area. Uh, we are on the Pacific Flyway. Um, there is a fabulous uh, uh, website called birdcast.info that you can look at during the migration season if you're interested, and see how many birds have flown over the area where you are. 
So this morning, I went to that site and typed in Sacramento, and it told me that last night, 775,000 birds flew through Sacramento on their way north for the breeding season. Wow. I will also tell you uh, what many of the most likely birds to see are. So right now, for instance, uh, those of us who love bird photography are trying to take pictures of the warblers and flycatchers and other kinds of birds that are here maybe for only a couple of weeks. We're hoping to catch a glimpse of them on their way north. Uh, come fall, we'll be hoping to catch a glimpse of them on their way south. It's a great treat to see some of them as they pass through our area, and we're very fortunate to live in an area where that is happening. So this Swainson's hawk is one of the birds that comes here for the summer. It will be here for several weeks for the breeding season, and when that season is over, it will head south to Argentina. These birds fly unbelievable distances. Some of the little teeny tiny sparrows that we see may fly two to 3,000 miles each way on their migration journey. We take them so for granted, and it's just so amazing the biology that permits them to do that and the uh, very hazardous journeys that they undertake. Feeding is another opportunity to take pictures of birds. They sometimes are a little more distracted when they're hunting or feeding, and you do have the opportunity to get a more clear picture. So this is a double-crusted cormorant who has caught a fish. It will swallow that fish in its entirety. Their necks expand. It's amazing to see. And he is showing the crest, that gray on the side of the head is what gives this cormorant its name. Normally, during the year, the, black is, the head is completely black, but during the breeding season, they do show those crests. I was saying to someone at lunch today, my study of birds and experience in, in observing them uh, has taken away any moral imperative I might have had towards vegetarianism. Because if I don't eat them, they will eat each other. Uh, there are, are many birds. Bird world is not always a lovely, gentle place. There are many birds that raid one another's nests. The life of a new chick is a very, very hazardous place to be, uh, both from other birds, turtles, other dangers, such as falling out of nests, or even well-meaning human beings uh, who want to rescue a bird that may not need rescuing at all. So being aware of what birds eat, when and where, uh, is another good way to have an opportunity to take some interesting pictures. Courtship. Uh, this season is still pretty much in full swing. Uh, this is a pair of great blue herons engaging in some intimacies and a little ritual that is part of their courtship opportunity. The herons often are kind of fun to watch. The male will fly into the nest with a twig. Uh, he will present it to the female. She assesses whether it's adequate for the nest. She may place it in the nest. They gaze at it together, and then you know they do what the birds and the bees do. So they have a whole little process that goes through. Uh, some birds dance, and some, it's a, very quick, slam, bam, thank you, ma'am, no need to know your name. So it's, uh, and and we, we have lots of uh, sexy photographs, and uh, I chose not to bring some of those today. <laughs> but, but it's something that we see happening out in nature. And, of course, the nest building itself. This is a very teeny, tiny little bird called a bush tit. How it will get that stick into the nest, which is a kind of a sock-like affair that hangs from the limb of a tree. If you, see, if you think you see a dirty sock hanging from a tree limb sometime, look at it very carefully, because it may well be a bush tit nest. That's just what they look like. Uh, Oriole nests look somewhat similar. Um, and as I say, it's a very narrow opening. It's a long, slender sock. And how this bird was going to get that stick into the nest, I'm not sure, but they manage. So watching them do that, gathering up twigs, that's another aspect of behavior that can make for wonderful photographic opportunities. And of course, caring for the young. Uh, right now, we're starting to see lots of chicks. This is an American coot, uh, not one of most people's favorite birds, also known as a mud hen. Uh, very common here during the winter months. In the spring and summer, they migrate up to the Sierra and probably points farther away. I took this picture up in the Sierra Valley. And they have the most adorable chicks. So 
everybody loves to see a little duckling or chick or a little gosling, and this is the time of year when those are out and about everywhere. Not all birds are good parents. Uh, the American coot does have favorites, and uh, she does not prolong the life of those that she peels are not going to make it. So bird world is uh, a beautiful, wonderful, exciting place, but it is also full of all kinds of hazards, and not all of them come from the expected places. Birds fight, and boy, do they ever fight over all kinds of things. This is a picture I took in Japan, in Hokkaido, um, and it is actually a picture that wouldn't be eligible for a photo contest uh, because it's what's called a baited photo. Uh, the area there where I was uh, freezes over completely, and so the Japanese put out food for the birds because the waters are frozen over and they can't do their normal fishing. So this is a white-tailed eagle, and if you look just in the front, you'll see the fish, and the young bird has taken the fish and did not decide to give it up to its elder when the elder preferred that it should have the fish. So this is a little bit of bird discipline going on. And everything was fine. Both birds uh, walked away quite pleasantly from the little episode, but the young bird learned a lesson, and that is, you know, obey your elders. Uh, but we do see a lot of birds fighting. Um, this time of year, you might see crows being harassed by other smaller birds if they're too close to the nests. A lot of eagles, I'm absolutely amazed at the small red-winged blackbird that will attack an eagle that it feels is coming in, or a hawk that it feels is coming in too close to its nesting area. They're very, very defensive and want to make sure that they protect their areas as much as possible. Where do we find all of these birds? Well, in the Sacramento region, we are so lucky. Uh, walk along the American River can easily um, lead to seeing up to 65, 75 different species on almost any given day if you know what you're looking for. So it's a wonderful thing just to get out and walk along the American River Parkway. Of course, we have the Sacramento National Wildlife Refuge nearby. Uh, we have Gray Lodge. Uh, we have other places where you can go, um, Yolo uh, Yolo Bypass Wildlife Area is, has been closed, but is open again now. That's a wonderful place where you can go and do an auto tour. And your own backyards are amazingly full of different birds. I have a very small backyard. Uh, I don't really have a yard at all. I have a patio. Uh, but there's an oak tree nearby, and I have a little fountain on my little patio. And I started keeping track, and I've had about 22 species of birds that visit my little patio over the course of a year. So once you know you're looking for different birds, they are there and they're great fun to see and watch. Some of the most common birds in the Sacramento area are still fun to photograph. I mean, I love to get the exotic birds, but even our ordinary everyday birds to me have their own kind of beauty and I love to try and capture that. So this, you all know and have heard, I'm sure this is a scrub jay. We see them all the time. Uh, they are particularly lovely at certain times of the year when their blues are bluest and their calls are always of, uh, equally annoying. <laughs> uh, the yellow-billed magpie, and you probably all know this is our treasure in California. This is a bird that exists in only a few places in California, nowhere else in the world. So very avid birders from around the world will fly to Sacramento just to ha add this to their life list and say that they have seen this bird. A few years ago, they were decimated by an episode of West Nile virus. Uh, they have started coming back nicely, and there are many places around the area where we readily see them. And for people who have them in a the park next to their house or in their yard, or they see them constantly, we think of it as an ordinary bird, but it isn't. Uh, it's a very special, unique bird that is in our area. Uh, it's a cousin to the crow and is equally smart, just a very special bird. Now this uh, kind of breaks my earlier ethics rule I was mentioning about not getting too close to nests. Uh, this is a group of house finches, but what they did is they built their nest in a wreath on my front door. Uh, and I felt that gave me special privilege to go in for the close-up. Uh, there were 
Five of them, I was away for a couple of weeks, and while I was gone, the mother started building the nest. By the time I came home and recognized there was a nest in the wreath, there was an egg. The next day there were two, the next day there were three. So ultimately five eggs, all of which hatched, and so I was unable to use my front door for about six weeks. So I do like having a wreath on the door. I have one on my door now, and I check it every day, and if I'm going to be away, I take it down. White-breasted nuthatch. If you happen to have a bird feeder in your yard, I'm sure you've seen this bird. It's a very common bird. This is a very common pose, but it's just a charming little bird that scurries all around the uh, trunks of trees and apparently occasionally peers out to see what's going on in the tree one over. Great egret, another very common bird in this area, um, but so beautiful. I just can't resist photographing these birds whenever I see them. It's another bird we tend to take for granted, but they are, I think, just among our most beautiful birds. Common merganser is a species of duck, also very common on the American River. Here she is with her chicks. This is one of a number of birds that actually ride their babies around on their back when they're first born. And that is the picture I would really like to get. I don't have that picture yet. But they're probably emerging just about now, so I have my eye out for that. Uh, but our mute swans, our um, pie-billed grebes, and some of the other species here also have this habit of allowing the little tiny new, newly hatched chicks to ride on their back. Understandably, they're very, very cautious at that time, so it can be hard to come across them. Uh, but it's a fun sight to see. And I love this lady with her wild hairdo. <laughs> Not everybody appreciates this bird. I call this picture a good time to look alive. Um, the turkey vulture is one we often see in the skies overhead. It's such an important and underappreciated bird. Uh, this is our garbage man. Uh, turkey vulture is a bird that never kills or hurts a thing. Uh, it only goes for things that are already dead, and it cleans them up for us. You can see it has no feathers on its head, so it can stay pretty neat while it's diving into uh, its current meal. Uh, they fly overhead. They have amazing sense of sight and smell, so they can find that carrion on the ground and take care of it so that the environment stays clean and in good order. Um, I think these are important, wonderful birds that are beautiful in their own way. So we have wonderful birds in the Sacramento region, uh, but it is fun to travel to other places and see other kinds of birds. Uh, so one place that I went uh, about a year and a half ago was Bosque del Apache in New Mexico. And some of the birds I saw there are similar to birds we see here, or the same birds, but seeing them in a different environment, in a different setting, made it really fun, and having just a great focus on, uh, on bird photography. So this is obviously a sandhill crane coming in to land in the evening. Uh, and this is a murmuration of blackbirds. We think of murmurations of starlings, and it is starlings that give it the name murmuration because of the sound that they make. But other birds do this flying in a formation that creates a kind of a kaleidoscope effect in the sky. Just amazing to see. So this was a murmuration of blackbirds. Northern pintail in the sunset with the light and reflections. Migratory bird, they're here in the winter uh, and they're gone for the season now. And this is Dawn at Bosque del Apache. Uh, and I have a little story about this. I'll try to make it really brief. I got there along with a group of about eight women at uh, 6 a.m., 26 degrees, pitch black, because at sunrise, the birds fly up, and we wanted to be there and see this massive fly up of snow geese and Ross's geese and sandhill cranes. So we're in the dark, setting up our equipment, our little fingers freezing off, and we're in rent-a-cars, and one of the ladies accidentally leaned against her car in such a way that it set off the car alarm. And we weren't the only people. There were about 150 other photographers there hoping to see the site. And we could all see this vast black shadow as the birds rose before the sun did. <laughs> it's funny now, but it wasn't then. And these are the snow geese that also come to the Sacramento region for the winter and have now flown north to the Arctic Circle for their breeding season. 
This is Northumberland in the UK. And I'll say something right now that every uh, PowerPoint presenter is always told not to say. And that is, I know you can't see it, but all along these cliffs are thousands and thousands of tiny white dots. And those are birds. This is an area where birds come for breeding and uh, raising their young for just a couple of months every summer. And these are the birds. They're called northern gannets. They are pelagic birds, which means that for the rest of the year, they never touch land. They live completely in the ocean. And they only come to land to breed, to mate, build their nests, and breed. And then they leave, and it's a complete ocean-bound life for the rest of the year. And they're beautiful birds, as you can see. Atlantic puffin, this is the bird that uh, caused me to make this particular trip, and it is also a pelagic bird. The puffins are only on land for this short period of time. When we were driving out to, we are riding in a boat out to the little islands where they nest, I was really so excited I was going to see puffins, and I would see one or two in the water and try to take a picture, and the woman that was leading the trip was kind of laughing at me, because when we got to the islands, there were thousands of them everywhere. So <laughs> she knew that was coming. This is kind of the iconic portrait of the uh, puffin that everybody wants with the mouthful of sand eels to take back to its burrow. These birds uh, breed and nest in these little rocky islands off the course of Northumberland, and every year they return not just to the same island, but to the same burrow. Uh, this is a kittiwake. It's a type of gull. Uh, that is found in that area, and very loud. Again, another bird that comes there to breed, and I just love the red mouth. And they have a lot to say, and so this was a fun picture. Uh, the birds are not always glad to see me. So here I am on the island. That's an Atlantic turn on my head. When I got there, we were staying in a little uh, kind of a stone bungalow, you know, very British flavor, and the um, trip leader said, you know, we have a washing machine and dryer here, and we're just like as a courtesy to ask all of you trip participants, if you notice that there's a lot of bird poop on your clothes, please rinse that off before you use the washer and dryer. It was like, how am I going to get bird poop on my clothes? I don't understand. Well, this is how. Uh, the birds were not, are not necessarily happy to see you. Um, they ha there had been no people on these islands for a couple of years because of COVID, and some of them had built their nests very close to the boardwalk where, the, where you were restricted to walking, and they were not happy that we were walking that close. Uh, another trip I made just earlier this year was to Hokkaido, Japan, where it was very cold. So we would out before dawn most mornings, and it was usually about zero degrees Fahrenheit. This is a stellar sea eagle, an endangered species that winters in that cold area every year. Um, and they are fed by the Japanese people who put uh, fish out in the frozen bays. It's a long-tailed tit. Uh, this uh, tit is very interested in that icicle because it's hanging off the edge of a maple tree. And some of the sap has gotten into the icicle. So the tit would fly in very quickly to lick and get a little bit of that sugary sweetness. And so to make this picture, I stood for about an hour and a half, focused on the icicle, waiting for the bird to come. It came in many times, but so quick, so in and out, so fast. Uh, so it took a long time for the, um, for the light to be just right and the position of the bird to be just right and get this picture. And I wanted to try even more, but the sun came out and the icicle fell, so the opportunity was gone. And these are the birds that caused me to make the trip to Japan, the snow cranes, uh, also known as formally as red-crowned cranes. Uh, they are also an endangered species. There are only about 1,500 of them in the world, and they were hunted nearly to extinction for their beautiful feathers. Uh, but now they are very protected in both Russia and in northern Japan, and they are so elegant. They're bigger than our, they're cousins to our sandhill cranes, but they're larger, uh, and they dance even more beautifully and elegantly. And the most wonderful, magical way to see them is in a snowstorm. So each day we looked at the weather forecast, and we knew finally that a snowstorm would be coming. So we went out at 7 in the morning to take positions where we would 
be able to see the birds and stood there for about five hours trying to get you know, that wonderful photograph. And this was one of my favorites. So there are several different types of bird photography. Uh, at, at least, let's say, I, I don't think I've uniquely created these categories. I think most people would agree, but these are my categories. One is photo of record. So this is a black pole warbler, and I don't consider this to be a particularly high quality photograph, but I love to photograph birds, and whenever I see a bird and I'm not sure what it is, I particularly want a picture of that bird because it might be something really interesting. So I took this picture and I posted it on a site for bird identification, um, and then I went about my other business for the day, and my phone just started blowing up. I was like, what's going on? I, and I was busy, I was paying no attention to that. And I finally got a phone call from a friend who's an excellent birder. And she said, Michelle, Michelle, you have to post the co geographic coordinates of where you saw that black pole warbler. That's an amazing bird. We all want to see it. I had no idea. So it's a photo of record. Had I reported, oh, I saw a black pole warbler, um, you know, there would have been some questions because I'm not really known for my bird identification capabilities. Uh, but the photo uh, was proof that the bird had been seen, photo of record, and a number of other uh, more knowledgeable birders went out immediately to the site to confirm the fact that this bird had been seen in our region. And it happens periodically. Uh, every day is there's issued a Sacramento rare bird alert, a Yolo County rare bird alert, for those people that want to add to their life lists um, and Often, if a bird is really rare in this area, it's very important to have a photograph to prove that that bird was seen. So this is a photo of record that this bird was here. Another type of bird photography, a documentary image, to document a type of behavior. And these are the kind of pictures that might be primarily of interest maybe to a nature magazine. And in this case, this is a great blue heron and it is removing the eggshells after the babies have, the chicks have hatched. And this is something that a number of different birds do. They clean up the nest once the nestlings have hatched and toss the eggshells out over the edge of the nest. And so I've seen, at other times, I've seen the fragments of nest. Um, eagles do it as well. I've seen egg fragments around the edge of a nest. But I was able to actually capture, be there by luck at the moment when the bird was tossing the eggshell out. So that kind of documentation of a type of behavior is a fun photograph to get. And of course, portraits like you see in bird magazines are lots of fun. I mean, so many birds are so beautiful and it's so fun to have just a lovely portrait of that bird. This is a cinnamon teal. Uh, it's a type of waterfowl uh, that is here much of the year. So here's a question this group might have thought about before. Um, and the question is, okay, it's bird photography, the birds are pretty, but is it art? What is art? Uh, and I just have a feeling that members of this organization have asked themselves that question many times. And it's a question I ask myself every time I take a picture of a bird. Is it art or not? What makes art? To me, uh, it means that it's a photograph that you might want to actually live with and look at again and again. And so these are just a few pictures that I think maybe meet that criteria for being something more than a documentary photo or a portrait, but maybe for being an actual work of art. And so this is back to the snow cranes, which I think almost any picture of the snow cranes is a work of art. So this is one of my favorite snow crane images. This is that eider chick. Uh, You've heard of eider down. It comes from these particular birds. And so uh, this was also in the UK. And this was, uh, to get the picture, I just all I had to do was lie down on the wet beach and <laughs> wait for the chick to uh, decide that I wasn't harmful and approach. And it was a curious chick. I was lucky. But this is a picture I like seeing again and again. These are black neck stilts in a golden dawn. And this, these are the colors. I do very little to my images. I really think that the natural setting, the natural look of the images is adequately beautiful. So I have not adjusted the color here or done anything like that. Every, every picture does require some 
processing because the camera can never see exactly what your eye sees. So I do use Lightroom and Photoshop and various apps to make sure that the photo portrays what I think I saw. But this is what I saw, and I actually had an argument with the, I don't want to say argument, I had a discussion with a gentleman about it. I had a show uh, at a local area, and this picture was one of them, and the man said, this is a wonderful painting. And I said, you know, actually, it's a, it's a photograph. And he said, no, no, it's not. Look, look more closely, and you'll see this is actually a painting. So, so we, we had that interesting discussion. <laughs> Uh, this is uh, Snow Goose Fly Up, uh, and I just created a little mood here by simply using a slower shutter speed. Uh, Snow, Goose, Snow Goose Fly Up is an absolutely amazing experience to see and hear, and most people who, um, who follow birds and are around uh, some of these nature areas at all have seen that at least at one time or another. The sky suddenly fills with birds, with the noise, um, and it's Truly, we overuse the word awesome, but it is truly an awe-inspiring experience. So I've tried so many times to capture that in a photograph, and I like this because I think it adds a little dynamism, and again, is an image that I like to see again and again. Wood ducks are a Sacramento bird, and they're just one of our most beautiful birds. This is the male. The female is beautiful in her own way, but she looks very different. Uh, and uh, reflections are an important part of photography, and I thought this was a nice one with the natural fall lights in this case. And the dance of the snow cranes. Can't get enough of those. They're just absolutely amazing, beautiful birds. Here again in the snowstorm. It is not a black and white photograph. If you look closely, you can see the red crown. But I think it captures the spirit of the birds and the reason why people love to go see them. So for some reason, about a year and a half ago, I decided that I like, I've always been in communications and I decided that I uh, wanted to share my pictures on a regular basis. So I send out a little daily email with a, a bird photograph and a little story about it. And if anyone is interested in receiving that, just let me know. I'd be glad to add you to the list. And um, I also send one out that's too much for some people, so I also have a list of people that get it once a quarter. <laughs> so thank you very much. Are there any questions that I can answer? I guess we, oh, we have a microphone. Thank you, William. Uh, those are absolutely fantastic images and a great body of work. Thank I'm, you. I'm in awe. I, I discern kind of two, a binary division. Most of the images, the animals seem to be unaware of you and candid, but there were at least two images where it appeared that the bird was engaging you in some way. One was the eider chick, and the earlier the one with the red mouth. Oh, yeah. And, can you talk a little bit about the difference between kind of candid pictures and, and pictures where it looks like you're engaging them, or, or was that an accident, or did that actually happen? Well, um, the, the eider chick absolutely was aware that I was there. So yeah, there are reactive pictures like that. I really try uh, not to be seen. I mean, I try not to be interacting with the birds. But a mallard duck has a peripheral vision of 360 degrees. There's no way that bird doesn't see me. So there are many times when the bird is looking away, but it sees me. So I wear camouflage clothes, I stand still, I have camo covering on my um, camera so that I hopefully am as unobtrusive as possible. Um, and But I have to assume that the bird almost always knows I'm there. There's times if I'm quiet in the bushes for a long time, it might not. If it's feeding, it might be more uh, distracted with that or caring for its young so that it's not particularly aware. But I'm pretty sure that 99.9% .9 of the time, the bird knows I am there. Other questions? Oh.
You have beautiful images. Um, you showed your equipment list at the very beginning, and you clearly have a huge camera lens attached to your camera. Is that what you started with, or you graduated to something you know that's on your list? What what's the starter kit per se? <laughs> Well, you know, it kind of depends on what you're doing. So um, if you are taking pictures in your backyard of a bird that is at your feeder or on a branch near your feeder, um, people can make those kind of pictures, I would say, with a 70 to 200 millimeter zoom kind of lens. Um, if you want to get out in nature, um, it just gets bigger and bigger. So a lot of people shoot with a 1 to 400. Um, people put a teleconverter on that to expand the range. Every photographer wants more range. There's just no way around it. But there are people who make great photos in particular situations with lesser lenses. There are less expensive longer lenses and more expensive longer lenses. Um, however much money you have, you can spend that on your equipment. <laughs> What did you say is the um, website for the rare bird sightings in Sacramento? Oh, um, well, that's, a, um, that's actually an alert list um, that you can subscribe to. And I, talk to me after. I'll see if I can find that on my phone and give you that information. The site for the migrating birds is birdcast.info. Hi, Michelle. Wonderful photography. I'm interested in your selection and editing process. I'm a bad photographer, so it's really easy for me to call through my pictures. You must have thousands of pictures per day, even. How do you do it? Do you do like the optometrist? Do you prefer this to that? Choose one <laughs> and go on? Well, um, so uh, yeah, no, that's a, there's a challenge. That's a challenge. The, the, Many of the pictures I take are easily eliminated because they're just no good. Um, you know, it's the feet in the corner of the frame, it's out of focus, it's a uh, bad background, it's uh, uh, unflattering to the bird. Uh, there are just a million reasons to get rid of most of the pictures that I take. And beyond that, it's, is it really in sharp focus? Um, does the bird look good? Um, do I like the colors? Was the lighting right? There's so many reasons to eliminate a photo, and I just spend a lot of time going through them and getting rid of the ones I don't care for. Do you use uh, apps like Photoshop? Yes. Yeah. Any particular version? Uh, I use uh, Lightroom. Uh, most of the work I do now, I do in Lightroom, and then I use Photoshop for some fine tuning. You know, the uh, bird do on the post, the picture's great except for that, um, enhancing the color. And I subscribe, there's a subscription program that Adobe has for 10 bucks a month so that you never have to update your software. Uh, other people use other systems, but that's, that's what I've kind of come up with. Other questions? Yes, there are quite a few. Um, and a great place to find out about them is to the uh, Sacramento Audubon Society. Uh, they do a lot of walks. Uh, the Yolo Bypass Wildlife Area does walks periodically. The um, Sacramento Sanitation Bufferlands District has walks that are free on the weekends occasionally. Um, and you can go to all of those websites and ask them about that. So yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of opportunity for those educational kinds of walks. And they're, they're fun. So Michelle, I have a question. So to get those birds in flight, how many frames a second are you taking? Or <laughs> well, um, it depends on a couple of things. It depends on the size of the bird. Uh, big birds fly slower. So there's really two questions there. One is the shutter speed, which ranges from a 2,000th of a second to a 3,200th of a second. Um, and my camera, is, I'm usually shooting 20 frames a second. Okay, great, thank you. Other questions? Okay, if not, great. Pam. Thank you so much, thank mm -hmm. you everyone. Thank you. 
Okay, so I just told Michelle I'm going to sign up to get daily pictures of birds. <laughs> They're just amazing. So thank you all again for coming. And remember, we have a special um, lecture in June with Scott Shields. And have a nice rest of your day and stay cool. Thanks very much. Thank you.